Good morning. Thank you so much. First of all, it is an honor for me to be here and uh, to take part in this conference, in this uh, such a remarkable conference on universal jurisdiction. I can see so many, there are so many judges, lawyers, activists uh, presenting here for many years. All these people have fight against impunity and to defend and advocate for human rights. So it is impressive to have uh, a contribution and the participation of so many people at this conference. So first of all, I would like to make my comments in English. I was about to give my presentation in English. However, many of my friends were pulling my leg and they forced me uh, to give my presentation in Spanish. So I would like to apologize in advance if I make any mistakes. So contrary or to the other speakers at this round table, I'm going to focus my presentation not on international criminal courts, but on the international courts and mechanisms, criminal uh, mechanisms, both at international and at regional level, and their intersection and the cooperation that they have on a day-to-day -day basis. And also, I would like to, well, of course, all that in relation to universal jurisdiction. So there are three aspects within this interaction uh, from the human rights uh, courts and universal jurisdiction. So I'd like to share with you some reflections, first of all, about the level of interaction, the question of universal jurisdiction and the obligations on the part of states towards the victims that have been victims of uh, severe violations and breach of international law. Second, uh, we talk about universal jurisdiction and the rights of the defense, and then the question of subsidiarity, which is a relevant topic here in Spain in the wake of the new law. So regarding the first aspect, that is to say the obligations of state, the duty of the state. Well, it is very obvious, but still it must be said that the role of the organization of human rights is very much different from the role played by the international court for human rights. Well, the mechanisms that I am referring to have to do with the responsibility of the states. We are not talking about private accountability, but a state's accountability. Here, we, these mechanisms come from, from the competence that the states have given, given according or in some treaties. So they are, and they can also apply specific or interpret specific treaties. So it is not surprising to find different courts and different mechanisms of human rights and to have different approaches when it comes to enforcing their jurisdiction. This is so because they are applying different treaties and different treaties with different provisions. So therefore, to start off, I would like to mention, for instance, the Committee Against Torture that applies the Convention Against Torture and as well as well progressive uh, provisions regarding universal jurisdiction. It has emphasized in several locations the need or the obligation, rather, to investigate cases of torture, no matter where crimes were, uh, despite the nationality or the place or the country where the crimes were committed. So it highlights the obligation to investigate cases of torture and, of course, the uh, also enforcement or implementation of universal justice. We could question the effect of these decisions, 
but they are there to bolster, to strengthen the need of these uh, provisions as obligations and to apply them in a specific cases, in a specific circumstances. And perhaps they also show a level of international um, recrimination that was mentioned yesterday, that is to say international reaction whenever these obligations are not fulfilled, whenever these universal jurisdiction obligations are not fulfilled. When I think about reports, well, the, for instance, the Heysen Havre report, Mr. Brody mentioned that yesterday these reports on torture make it make very clear the obligation that the states have to investigate these cases. These reports have been quoted and have been used across several courts. So these reports of the Commission against torture, we may wonder what is the impact of them, what is the strength of them. But it is true that at the end of the day, this, it is implemented. It is implemented, and it has an effect, and it is valid and accepted by other courts, courts of different instances, for instance, the CICC or in other courts. And it has now it has also contributed to take us where we are now, that is to say, it has taken us to the happy situation, a happy possibility to prosecute uh, Havre in Africa under universal jurisdiction. The Committee Against Torture, I would like to mention that it is not the one and only example of a Committee of Human Rights that states the obligation of implementing universal jurisdiction in some cases. I would like to share with you uh, the relevant role played by the committee on the children's rights. It is a, it has a new, well, it is an opportunity for the future to defend children's rights. In its reforms on the obligation of states, the committee has pointed out as an obligation the extension of jurisdiction of states with a view to ensure that they can implement a jurisdiction extraterritorially. It has also mentioned specifically universal jurisdiction and requesting, for instance, that Thailand and that the DRC the Democratic Republic of Congo extends their jurisdiction so that they can implement jurisdic universal jurisdiction beyond the territory. Another example of international mechanisms that emphasize or highlight the obligations regarding universal jurisdiction. Obviously, there are other mechanisms such as special rapporteurs or task forces that have carried out remarkable work. And I think that half of the special rapporteurs are present in this conference. I'm not going to tell you about the work. I would let them do so for you. However, well, as I say, that committee also talks about obligations. Now, moving on to regional courts. Situation perhaps, uh, well, it's slightly different, but it's different for several reasons. As we know, we have a detailed body of jurisprudence in these courts, starting off with Inter-American Court for Human Rights, but also now we also have that from the Uriam Court of Human Rights from the, about the need to investigate, prosecute, and offer re 
pre preparation to the victims. But it is important to understand that in these cases that it has been interpreted or stated in the jurisprudence of these courts, we are not talking specifically, this is not about the actual implementation of universal jurisdictions. They set out standards that resulted from the lack of investigation and prosecution of crimes that have been committed within the state or whenever agents of that state had uh, breached, violated, has breached or has violated human rights outside the country, that country. It is a complicated issue. I'm not going to dwell into that. But it has to do with jurisdiction, with the limitation on the jurisdiction set out on the regional conventions on human rights and on the competences of the regional courts on human rights. But also I'd like to mention that the jurisdiction of these courts is limited. It's limited in the sense that conventions are applicable to people and ensure defense and respect of human rights within the territory, within the state, or within the jurisdiction of that state. That in some cases has been, uh, some, in some cases it is extraterritorial jurisdiction. But I would like to say that there are limitations as to the scope and as of the jurisdiction of these courts. Also another difference that we should be aware of is that these conventions are general conventions and they deal with or they refer to several human rights. Some violations of these human rights are not considered are not crimes according to typified as crimes according to international law. So therefore it is not surprising sometimes to find these courts not investigating or prosecuting violations of some human rights that have been committed outside the territory. So, and then, of course, this could have an impact on the avenues to walk or the or for those victims that request their state to implement universal jurisdiction, and for some reason the state refuses to do so. It is not clear <clears throat> whether there is the possibility to present these cases before the regional courts. I don't want to state here that it is impossible, but lots of consideration, careful consideration should be uh, given to it. We don't really want to create full expectations as to the possibilities or capacities of these courts. However, I'd like to mention something which is relevant of in this body of jurisprudence that states about the uh, states the obligation to investigate this detailed body of jurisprudence gives us tools to understand the content the content of the obligation to investigate what does that mean whenever a state says that has carried out investigation what are the requirements and parameters of a true investigation and according to this jurisprudence and these regional mechanisms in Latin America, Africa, and Europe, we don't see clues as to what that obligation to investigate, prosecute, and to offer reparation means. Well, investigation has to be sound, rigorous, independent. They also state that there is jurisprudence stating the rights of the victims, 
that are involved are taken into account within these investigations, sometimes offering or providing access to the victims, to the reports, to the investigations. And of course, these should be investigations leading to identifying culprits. Well, there is also jurisprudence on human rights, which is relevant for this uh, topic and the discussion. That being the independence, judicial independence. Judicial independence is ensured, of course, under many international conventions as well, national and regional conventions and have been the subjects of many the decisions made by these bodies and courts. And I think that we have listened to examples of political interferences in criminal cases. We have been listening to that, hearing that in the past days, and this is like alarming. We have heard about the politicization of justice, also commercialization of justice. The idea that justice can be subject to negotiation amongst politicians from different countries could also be subject to outside interferences from politicians from other countries, but this is uh, fully against the impartiality or independence of universal justice. So more attention should be paid to the workings of these systems. Well, this is the first point regarding obligations uh, to investigate. There is lots of uh, jurisdiction on the obligation to investigate, prosecute, and to offer reparation. And from some courts, we also have indications and clues as to the obligation to implement universal jurisdiction. In view of the role played by the Court of Human Rights, this also forces us to see it from a different perspective. We have highlighted a lot, uh, we have focused a lot on the rights of the victims. Victims, and also we have highlighted the importance of the criminal process as part of the reparation offered to the victims. Um, However, I think it should be remembered as well as highlighted. Any process of universal jurisdiction for it to be legitimate has to fully respect the rights of the defense. It is within this context that universal jurisdiction has been implemented in the courts. In some cases, we've seen that the accused have argued that universal jurisdiction breaches the human rights. Some of them have argued that the crimes had not been constituted as crimes in the way they were they committed the crime. They have also argued the implementation of universal justice was not foreseeable. Well, we have Georges versus Germany under the European Court. Also, Hisan Habre, he also put forward this argument before the ECOWAS, it is the Western Africa Court, and also before the CPI. So none of these courts have accepted these arguments. That is to say, they have not accepted that there is a problem in terms of universal jurisdiction and the defense of the rights of the accused. Because if the crimes were 
constituted as crimes in, in the international law. That's what it is to critical, but not that it, they were constituted as crimes under international law. However, there are questions about the rights of the defense that come out, with, that arise within the context of universal jurisdiction. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to refer to to them, but in terms of the rights of the defense of these suspected people, it is important to remember that the same rights apply. They may be applied in a different way, and well, there is a degree of flexibility in the application of these rights, but I don't see any specific conflict, but the, the appearance or tension is likely. Someone mentioned yesterday about the uh, freedom of bailout, of bail. Freedom under bail, liberty to be to remand on parole. So there are some challenges. There are some challenges in terms of universal jurisdiction to ensure, to make sure that the rights of the defendants are respected. Also very important topic. If you are going to enlarge or to change the category of the crimes, the crimes that are stated under universal jurisdiction, we have to be very careful about this question. Well, there is a difference between prosecution for crimes of uh, against humanity, torture, genocide. It is, to, to my mind, is completely different from prosecuting uh, crimes or terrorism. I've just finished the thousand pages book. Terrorism is not well stated under international law as a, uh, as a crime. If you are going to prosecute a person on grounds of terrorism, you have to ensure that it was well stated on the law when it was uh, when the crime or terrorism act was uh, committed. Uh, well, in the case of genocide in Guatemala. After so many years, they, well, well, they tried to convince everyone that it was actually genocide. Now it has been, now it is referred to as terrorism in terms of prosecuting it. It is so, it is disappointing. Last, I would like to refer to the subsidiarity principle. Subsidiarity is a well-established uh, principle under international law for human rights. It limits the jurisdiction and as well as the mechanism of human rights to situations where states or where the victims have uh, run out or depleted all the internal resources and where the states have had the opportunity to offer a remedy of reparation to the victims and in cases of uh, breaches of uh, serious crimes to investigate and to prosecute those crimes. Well, and it could be compared to the principle of complementarity that Christian has referred to before, meaning that the ICC can only carry out an investigation whenever there is a state who hasn't got the will with unwilling to do so. This principle of subsidiarity exists as a rule of international law when we are discussing or talking about the relationship between parties. So, so far, to me, it is not a rule. I don't see it as a rule. However, there are good reasons, there are indeed many advantages to it, as it has been said, uh, yesterday here. So when you see that investigations and justice is taking place or is carried out in the place where the crimes were committed, this is the preferred situation. So therefore, the principle of subsidiarity, in principle, it is a principle that we can accept. However, there are a number of questions 
And here we could refer to the practices carried out by some relevant international courts that could throw light lights about this uh, subsidiarity principle. First of all, this principle before the court is applicable to that state that says that the court has no jurisdiction to prove that this state is carrying out the research or has conducted an investigation and to prove that that process is a process that deserves to be given the opportunity to go ahead. To Therefore, it is for the state. And according to the jurisprudence of the European Court for Human Rights, it is well established that in this type of cases, it is the state, the state that has the information about the process, but victims do not have access to all the information that is there. Sometimes the victims are outside the country, they have been exiled, and it is only the state that has access to that. That's why the ECHR has mentioned that it is very important <clears throat> so that the subsidiarity principles should not impose a necessary law to the victims. I would like, uh, I wanted to mention that in here because I think it was important to highlight that because of the risks that it poses. I will be finishing. Well, okay, I don't really want my uh, the chairperson to be angry with me. So I just would like, wanted to, well, if you are interested in discussing this topic further, we can do that over a coffee break. I would like to mention the importance of universal jurisdiction. And according to the cases that I've seen, that I've worked on, I would like to mention that nowadays there are open cases before the European Court of Human Rights about the extraordinary rendition. So the situation of absolute impunity for those crimes, it is abs an absolute challenge, a very important challenge. In terms of the international law and the diminishing of it, so this, so the main objective here is to foster justice in the states and to foster criminal processes. It is only then when we have the possibility to individualize the. Uh, that responsibility that we have for accountability, that we have to offer justice to the victims. And uh, on this point, I finish my presentation. Thank you.